Hi, I'm the Lockpicking Cuba, and in this video I'm going to be looking at these, TSA padlocks. I'll explain why they exist in the first place, and why it's kind of funny that they still exist. And I'll also show you why the security they offer is so very terrible. You can probably see what all these locks have in common. It's this little red diamond. This is the logo created by a company called Travel Century, which was set up in 2003 following new regulations that the TSA, the American Transportation Security Administration, put in place after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The idea was that the TSA wanted to be able to open your checked suitcase to look for dangerous articles, and passengers wanted to be able to lock their suitcase without the lock being cut off. So in 2003, Travel Century reached an agreement with the TSA to sell locks with a back door in them. The back door would allow t the TSA to open all the locks using a single master key. Brilliant! Or not so brilliant, there were so many problems with this idea. Also in 2003, a man named David Tropp filed for a patent in the US for, well, exactly what Travel Century were doing. The main claim of his patent, the bit that describes what is being protected by the patent, was for the following. A lock with a combination and also a master key, marketing the lock to consumers so they'd know how it would be used, a logo to tell the TSA or other agency that it was a lock they'd be able to open, and, crucially, the patent covered the TSA opening up the lock to inspect the luggage. And I'll explain in a minute why that's important. So, in 2004, TROP set up Safe Skies, selling these padlocks with this torch logo instead of the Travel Sentry diamond that would work in exactly that way, just like the competing locks from Travel Sentry. In 2006, the patent was granted, and later that same year, Safe Skies sued Travel Century for patent infringement. Eventually, Trop's case was thrown out for a really hilarious reason. Because the patent included the act of the people who actually opened the suitcases using the master key, and since Travel Century didn't do that, the TSA did it, that meant Travel Century couldn't be infringing the patent. To infringe a patent, you have to be doing all the things described in at least one of its claims. The TSA and Travel Sentry were doing that between them, but neither one of them was doing it on their own. So Trop's case was lost. And now, if you fast forward to 2021, these Travel Sentry locks are everywhere, and Trop's Safe Skies locks are all but impossible to find. But what about security? Sadly, this story is even funnier or sadder, depending on how you look at it. In late 2014, the Washington Post published an article about the TSA. In that article, the seven types of master keys for TSA locks were shown, clearly, as you can see in this photo. Almost a year later, someone on the R lockpicking subreddit posted the photo. And not long after that, 3D printer files were generated that would allow anyone to 3D print the master keys. And nowadays, well, you can buy nice metal versions of them from eBay for a handful of dollars. And what that means is that anyone with a few dollars and access to eBay can buy the key that opens all these padlocks. Here's one that I bought. It doesn't open every TSA padlock just the ones that use key number seven, but that's the vast majority of them. Now, some of these padlocks have a feature that shows you if the padlock has been opened using the key. This green flag shows you that this padlock has not been opened using the key. If the TSA or anyone else uses a key to open the padlock, the flag turns red. It stays red after we lock the padlock, and it only turns green when we open it using the combination. I also have the key for number two, which opens this padlock. Um, but this was the only number two padlock that I was able to find online. Almost all the TSA locks you can find online are number sevens, and number seven is the key that's easiest to find ready-made online. But the truth is, none of this really matters, because the TSA wafer locks are so crappy that anyone can open them with extremely basic tools and basically no knowledge. I'm using a wave rake, but it's basically just a relatively strong, bendy piece of metal that opens these padlocks, all of them. If you can open one of these with a rake or a tool like this, you can open all of them because they all have the same lock. Now, it is possible to find TSA locks that aren't number two or seven, and without 3D printing them yourselves, it's quite hard to find the keys for those ones. So this padlock, for example, is a number six. It's the only number six I've been able to find online, and it's a really interesting one because Number six means using a dimple lock. These are made by a company called Forge in the US, and if you do have to buy a TSA padlock, this one might be the one worth getting, because although you can print the key if you have a 3D printer, it's much harder to find master keys for number six online. And although it is possible to rake it open if you have the right tools, it's much harder than doing so for number seven or number two. 
Let's see if I can get this one open. There we go. Most TSA padlocks cost just a few pounds or a few dollars, but some of them, like this one, costs a lot more. This one, for example, is a fingerprint padlock. From what I can tell, it's a pretty good fingerprint padlock, except that it's also a TSA 07 uh, key lock, which means it can be opened using the TSA master key or raked open, for example. So this is a bit like putting a fingerprint recognition lock on a paper bag. And this padlock costs 55 pounds. And the worst thing is it's advertised as being suitable for house door, suitcase, backpack, school, gym, bike, office, or luggage. And this is the real problem. Not so much people using them on their luggage, but people using these to lock up their bike or their phone or their house or their wallet in the locker at a gym. Anyone who buys one of these padlocks for that purpose should be strongly advised against doing so. So in conclusion, if you're traveling into a country that uses these TSA locks, which includes the USA, Canada, Japan, Israel, Finland, Norway, Denmark, the Czech Republic, Germany, Austria, Belgium, Netherlands, Switzerland, South Korea, New Zealand, and according to the TSA website, soon other countries, and you want to lock up your checked luggage and you don't want the TSA or equivalent agency to cut the padlock off, you could use one of these TSA locks with the red diamond on. And if your goal is just to stop the suitcase from falling open while it's being thrown onto the plane, then that's probably not a bad idea. Not a great idea because these locks are so flimsy that the chances of them just snapping off in transit or on the luggage return conveyor belt is quite high. And there's also the risk of the TSA unlocking your lock and leaving it on the suitcase or in the suitcase unlocked in a state from which you can't lock it again unless you buy a master key or a rake. But it's not a terrible idea. If, on the other hand, you want to use one of these locks to lock something up and stop anyone apart from the authorised agencies from getting into your suitcase, then these locks will not do that. And if you want to use them for anything that really matters, you definitely shouldn't be doing so. All right, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this video and maybe you've learned something, even if it's just to avoid locks with this red diamond on it. Please do click on like or subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. Thanks so much for watching.